Namaste. Thank you, Manish ji. A very warm welcome to everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, as the first speaker of this conference, Dr. Coindrad Els today. Someone who needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Els distinguished himself early on as eager to learn and to dissent after a few hippie years, as he says himself. Uh, he obtained MA degrees in Sinology, Indology, Philosophy. And after a research stay at Banaras Hindu University, where we just had our uh, offline edition of the Shaivism conference, uh, he did original fieldwork for a doctorate on uh, Hindu nationalism in 98. And of course, he earned laurels in ostracism with his findings on hot items like Islam, multiculturalism, and the secular state, the roots of Indo-European Ayodhya temple dispute, and uh, Gandhi's legacy, and so on. He has published. Uh, widely and deeply on the interface of religion and politics, correlative cosmologies, the dark side of Buddhism, the reinvention of Hinduism, uh, various language policy issues, and uh, so on. Uh, he combines human sympathy with substantive skepticism in his own words. Uh, today, it is our great pleasure to listen to the respected prof on uh, the topic, Adi Yogi for export, Rudra becomes warden and proceeder. Welcome, sir. Okay, so far, so good. So we're going to talk about Shiva, the Adi Yogi, the original Yogi, and um, how he is uh, transformed, but, but still very recognizable in um, the figures of Poseidon in Greece and Woden among the Germanic people. So we are uh, going to talk about the Indo-European language family within which um, these evolutions have taken place. The um, original unified Indo-European was spoken about 6,000 years ago very probably, but that's not our topic, but as a background information, I'll say it anyway, probably in North India. Now, um, this uh, language has been the uh, conduit of a number of cultural uh, knowledge held in common, like a number of poetic motives and even expressions like the most famous one is uh, undying fame. That's the job of poets to, uh, to furnish to their employers. Undying fame, which is Shravas Akshitam in Sanskrit or Kleos Aftiton in Greek. <clears throat> we know of many cases of a transmission of cultural contents between Asia and Europe but most of that took place much after this common origin. <clears throat> like in Greek philosophy, we find a number of elements that are clearly in common with India, but that do not uh, show a cognate uh, influence between uh, India and Greece, for example, going back 6,000 years. No, that means that something like 2,500 years ago, there were people from Greece going to India or from India going to Greece, or at any rate, transmitting the cultural influence. And uh, so that's hardly what we are talking about here. Like for instance, Pythagoras, the Greek philosopher, uh, lived in some kind of ashram with a number of rules that are extremely similar to what in India we know as Jainism, like a, a, a rule that to become a member, you had to be silent for five years. They were vegetarian, they believed in reincarnation and so on. <clears throat> so most likely that is a late influence uh, from India upon Greece. It's not a common inheritance going back 6,000 years. <clears throat> 
similarly here with the, the Gundestrup cauldron. It's a famous uh, archaeological object found in Denmark. Now it shows a very famous picture, which you see here above. Uh, of Kernunos, who is very similar to Pashupati, to the famous seal from uh, Harappa, where the god is sitting uh, and surrounded by animals. <clears throat> and even more specifically, more undoubtedly pointing towards India, is the picture of Gaja Lakshmi, of Lakshmi surrounded by two elephants. Uh, giving her water. So that can hardly be found in Europe. That absolutely points to India because it's the, the westernmost places where elephants are found. Now, what interests us here is elements that have the same source that go back to 6,500 years, 600 years ago in a 6,000 years ago in a common origin. Uh, we have a famous example developed by Georges Dumézil in the mid 20th century, where he sees in uh, Roman society, Germanic society and so on, a division into three layers that um, can be summarized as the priestly class, the martial class and the productive class in which we can see social or societal applications of the famous three color scheme uh, that in India is known as Triguna with the, the white pole, the red pole and the black pole. And so he gives examples of the same scheme in uh, Rome, especially in Scandinavia. Uh, so that is something that is in common, and in fact, it's a very important theme. I think it's in India also very, very old. The, uh, it's, it's a central motive in Sankhya philosophy, which goes back very far, which is uh, the, main, um, the main contents of the Shanti Parva in uh, the Mahabharata, where you can see that the Sankhya is, is the oldest uh, philosophy. It has its roots in a dim, distant past, whereas the, the better known Vedanta philosophy is a later development. It's a bit more artificial or it's a bit more sophisticated, but it is therefore also younger. It, it is a more advanced stage of culture. Whereas this uh, Sankhya philosophy with its uh, division into three is age old and you find many traces of it in the Europe, in the Indo-European world or even earlier. Uh, there are a number of myths here, which um, uh, I have briefly mentioned and I'm going to go through them even more briefly, but you can all get the uh, uh, copy of my uh, PowerPoint presentation after this, this will all be sent to you. Um, so I'll go over it here. You have the famous myth of the dragon slayer. And so you find that everywhere, you find that even outside the Indo-European world, though probably transmitted from the Indo-European world. By contrast, here you have a myth, a mythic motive that is far older and that goes very much beyond the Indo-European world. There are versions of it in China, even among the Mayas in, uh, in Mexico. And so it's about the myth of the creation of the world by twins, one of whom does the actual creating, the other one also starts, but he gets killed in the process. And in fact, his death is essential to the process of creation because the survivor called Manu or Manu in India sacrifices Yemo or in Sanskrit Yama, which means the twin in order to use the elements of his body in order to create the elements of the universe. So uh, like you have uh, the version in Germanic 
concerning Emir. Emir is Yemo, is Yama. <clears throat> he gets killed and his body is divided. Uh, the, the skull becomes the heavenly vault. The feet become the earth. The eyes become the sun and moon and so on. <clears throat> Then uh, another mythic motive that is in common is about the thunder god, uh, which is in India mostly Indra, uh, who has the power to mask himself. And so this, this very mythic motive later is developed in Indian philosophy into the theme of Maya, that is to say in how the divine masks itself through the world, so that the world is some kind of uh, face covering of the divine. Uh, yeah, there are many examples, even very funny ones, you can read it here, but we are moving on uh, to another motive, the near invulnerability of the hero. Um, like uh, you have the story of Duryodhana, who is rendered invulnerable by his mother Gandhari. You see, she's wearing this blindfold all the time. And through that, her eyes have become very strong. And so when she once looks at him, he becomes immortal, uh, or not immortal, but invulnerable. However, he has been uh, convinced to wear a loincloth and so there, you know, at that place, there's no invulnerability, and that's where he ends up getting killed. Similarly, uh, Siegfried, uh, who is the son of the Thunder God, and so who has a similar character, uh, he um, takes a bath in the blood of the dragon that he has just killed. This makes him invulnerable but a leaf falls on his shoulder and later on an arrow pierces him at that spot and he dies. And you have the famous uh, heel of Achilles. His mother puts him in a magic potion, but she holds him by his foot. And so there he's not immortal or not invulnerable and there he gets killed and so on. So this is a very uh, clear common motive which is uh, present in the myths of many of these branches of the Indo-European family. <clears throat> there are many more. Um, take, for example, Homer, the Greek poet, is described as blind, which is rather unlikely. It's even more unlikely in the case of the Vedic seer, Dir Gatamas who writes a lot about the observation of the sky, which is hard to do if you're blind. So clearly here the reference is to the seer closing his eyes. Now that's what you do in meditation. And so this seems to be uh, a reference to the wisdom that they, they have acquired through meditation. <clears throat> so there are many more um, elements in common, but we go on. Um, so we're going to talk about yoga. And so one of the uh, early elements, one of the pre-Vedic elements is, uh, is yoga. And yoga is, in my opinion, and I will uh, say something that perhaps is not going to be liked by everyone, but um, I say that yoga is pre-Vedic, which means that there was a pre-Vedic age for those who believe that the Vedas were uncreated and are with us for millions of years ever since the universe was made. Uh, it, it will not be acceptable to say that there is a pre-Vedic period. Well, you see, I will say that there was a pre-Vedic period and uh, I will also shock your uh, secularist adversaries who, uh, on the contrary, say that uh, yoga and any deep, any profound contents in Hinduism are quite recent 
because the ancient Hindus were simplistic and silly and uh, they were not capable of something as profound as yoga. There also I disagree. I say that the yogic contents is pre-Vedic. It shines through the Vedas, even though I agree with Western scholars that the Vedas are not about yoga. It's not true that the science of yoga is, is uh, revealed to us uh, through the Vedas. No, I think yoga was older than the Vedas, but already known to some extent to the Vedic poets. And so it shines through, even though yoga is not the subject matter of the Vedas. Right. So I'm not the first one to say that much because that was the thesis of, uh, in my opinion, historic paper by Nick Allen, uh, a scholar from Oxford who died recently. It's called the Indo-European Roots of Yoga. So that's where he says that yoga dates back to the common period of Proto-Indo-European some 6,000 years ago. So he stumbled upon this insight by comparing uh, a famous episode from the uh, Odyssey, the poem by the Greek poem by Homer, and the Mahabharata, where he sees a number of parallels. He gives 23 of them. I've found a few more. Uh, like uh, it's about a journey that Arjuna undertakes and that Odysseus undertakes. And so there's a lot of parallels between the two stories. Um, but as uh, Nick Allen shows, there is also a difference, namely the trip that Arjuna makes is a yogic project in which he develops himself in terms of yoga, whereas yoga is completely absent as a theme in the journey by Odysseus. So uh, both have to prove themselves and have to, have to struggle a lot, have to go through some tests uh, for a god, a deity uh, known by wearing a, or by using a trident, a trishul, namely Shiva, respectively Poseidon in Greece. Arjuna's um, test is uh, very yogic. He has to do a num perform a number of yogic exercises, like for a month or so. He has to stand in a tree pose in Vrkshasana. Um, whereas Odysseus um, has no such profundities to do, he merely has to hold his own, he has to struggle against Poseidon, because Poseidon is uh, vengeful, uh, because his son, Polyphemus, he had uh, one eye here, and that was poked out by uh, Odysseus. So that's a bit of a, a, a jocular reference to the third eye. You see here, the third eye is not some mystical yogic uh, idea. No, it's just uh, some, some cartoon thing uh, that you see Polyphemus is depicted with. And so Odysseus makes fun of that by poking the eye out. So nevertheless, you see in mythology, Family relation always signifies likeness. So Poseidon and his son Polyphemus have a lot in common. They're both similar to Shiva, and so they are marked by a third eye. Um, this, in fact, in fact um, Poseidon and his brother Zeus are sometimes depicted with a third eye the knowledge of that idea of the third eye was still that, um, that serious, that important in Greece, that there are still depictions of it, even though the Greeks didn't understand anymore what the third eye is for. 
So even uh, Nick Allen himself says that uh, the um, yogic element in the story of Arjuna is original, was there from the beginning, whereas in the Greek version it has been lost. You see, you might also think that the other way is possible, that neither had this yogic dimension and the Indians discovered it in India. That's what you get in the famous Aryan invasion theory, where uh, the Indo-Europeans are barbarians and then they enter India and there they learn everything at the feet of the aboriginals, including yoga. Now, that's not, um, that's not what Alan argues for. He says, no, the, the Sanskrit yogic version is the original one and the Greeks lost it. What he doesn't say and what I add is that there is an explanation for why the Greeks lost it. Namely in the rough and tumble of their migration westwards. Well, it's not a very comfortable situation where you can preserve the most uh, sophisticated parts of your tradition. Uh, whereas in India, everything was normal. And so this knowledge uh, was stable and was developed further. <clears throat> Okay, now in the Vedic pantheon, there are traditionally 33 gods. And of these, there are 12 heavenly gods, the Adityas, then 11 atmospheric gods or Rudras, and then, well, no separate uh, slide for that, but there are also eight Vasus or earthly gods. Now among the Rudras, there is one, of course, called Rudra. It's him that we're talking about. Uh, there is also Vayu, which is the Dutch word Vayan, which is to blow, which is what the wind does. There's also the word Vata, uh, which actually is the word wind. It's related to the word wind. Um, Indra is sometimes classed among these gods, sometimes not, but he clearly belongs here because the thunder and lightning are an atmospheric phenomenon rather than a heavenly one. So um, those are these 11. 11 is a very typical word for the atmospheric gods because 11 is very unseizable, is a mysterious number, eight and 12, clearly represent the earth and the heaven, and they can easily be constructed. An octagon and a dodecagon can be constructed with a compass and ruler, whereas 11, you cannot uh, construct. So, And so it represents very well the effect of the winds that are unpredictable. Uh, one of them is Indra. And... Um, you see, Indra was depicted on an elephant, which is normal because it's very, very certain that as soon as mankind entered India and encountered elephants, that elephants were deified. They're such impressive animals. Um, now, I mentioned Indra simply to contrast him with Rudra. They are roughly the same. They're both thunder gods, storm gods. But Indra is the good storm. At the end of the, of the hot season, you suddenly get a rainstorm that opens the monsoon season. Now that's welcomed by the people because of very uh, suffering, you know, it's very hard to come through the hot season. Whereas Rudra is the dangerous storm in the mountains, which is very unpredictable. And, and Okay, um, and because it's so unpredictable and dangerous, uh, this Rudra is uh, approached uh, euphemistically. He's being flattered by the nickname Shiva, which means the good one, the beneficial one. Uh, that's a normal thing for people who are dangerous. There are many poems in favor of Joseph Stalin and also in Hindi, for uh, Hindi Urdu, for Aurangzeb. You see, the, the more dangerous a dictator, the more he's being flattered. 
And so that, in a sense, is what has happened to, uh, to Shiva. Uh, the um, atmospheric gods are the logical um, rulers of the process of uh, breathing, because breathing has to do with the air, is is related to, is akin to the wind. And the art of breathing, of course, is central to uh, control of consciousness, which is what yoga is about. So Rudra becomes the Adi Yogi, the original Yogi, already uh, often represented uh, in Harappa four or five thousand years ago. So again, a sign that uh, recent stories that yoga is only uh, as old as the Buddha, this is what m- many Western scholars nowadays say, uh, is absolutely uh, untrue. Okay, uh, um, Rudra has a band of young warriors around him. These are the Maruts. Interestingly, their number varies, you know, as it is mentioned by poets in different places, but it's always a manifold of the number nine. We have to keep that number nine in mind, as we will see. Um, now, in the Germanic world, we have Woden, or also known as Odin. Uh, he's surrounded by four animals, two raven and two wolves. So in a way, he's also a lord of the animals, a Pashupati. He's always depicted with a spear. That seems to be what has remained of the trident. Uh, at any rate, he has this object in his hand, just as uh, Shiva has the, uh, the trident. The name uh, comes from Vodanas, which means the Lord of Frenzy. Uh, so he's into uh, excitement, is being the European root of Vat, where from the Sanskrit word Vata. Um, so it means to be excited like the wind is, uh, but psychologically it means the frenzy of poets in which they are inspired. Um, he is depicted riding on a ho- an eight-footed horse through the sky uh, called Sleipnir, which means the sleepy one. Um, that he has eight legs can mean, just like in comic strips, where someone moves very fast, you see his legs being doubled. And so that's what it might mean but it means something more uh, precise if you look at it from the perspective of comparative uh, mythology. In Sanskrit, you have a figure called Sharabha. And so one uh, version of it is that he is an eight-legged deer. That's also how he appears in the Jatakas, the uh, Buddhist uh, stories of the previous incarnations of the Buddha. Uh, where he is a previous incarnation of the Buddha, of the, the Bodhisattva training himself in positive virtue. So he's a very nice uh, animal. So uh, two yes. more minutes. So. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I'm getting there. Um, he is depicted with these uh, triangles that you see on top here. This is called the Valknu, the, the knot of the fallen. It's related to the eternal knot, which you find in the Celtic world, but of course also in the Indian world, also in Tibet nowadays, the Sri Vatsa. Um, So the third eye is very much there. Um, Though the Germanic people didn't understand the symbolism anymore, so they reduce it to one eye. And then the story becomes that he sacrifices one eye in order to gain wisdom, the way that this uh, third eye in India signifies some kind of wisdom. Uh, So it seems that the people outside India lost the rationale uh, for the third eye, but still had that image with them. 
you know, during the rough and tumble of the migration, it is the most precious contents that are lost. Just like in a corpse, the brain starts decomposing immediately, whereas the bones can last for centuries. Um, Woden also he becomes literate. The Germanic people became literate only about 2,200 years ago. So it was a very big thing for them. And so it was identified with wisdom, which Woden acquires through a sacrifice. He hangs in a tree upside down in bat pose, which is an ancient uh, Indian yogic exercise. And he sacrifices his one eye in order to obtain wisdom. And he himself uses the very Upanishadic expression, he sacrificed himself to himself. Uh, then um, his, uh, the Maruts in India, here become the wild horde, the soldiers or berserkers uh, around uh, Woden. Um, they are, they can very well be co compared to the uh, Naga sadhus in India. So they have a strong element of uh, uh, fighting or wrestling. Um, at the same time, they take drugs in order to become strong and fearless. Like if you eat these mushrooms that they still have in Europe, you become you, you have a feeling of being very tall and of looking down on everything. So you become fearless. Um, more subtly, psychologically, the uh, war becomes a metaphor for the inner battle of sadhana. But so initially it means a physical battle. It means uh, martial training and so on. Uh, it's only in India that you have this metaphoric meaning of uh, the sadhana. <clears throat> so to conclude, uh, Shiva symbolizes the man who explores the spirit world. First, anciently as a shaman, which is uh, an institution that exists in most culture, cultures. Uh, people who do vision quests, often with the help of drugs. Um, like when I first stayed in um, Benares University during Mahashivaratri, much to my surprise, all these serious professors that I uh, had gotten to know uh, took some kind of preparation from uh, cannabis and were <laughs> strongly under the influence of drugs. So that, that is part of the tradition of Shiva and that goes back very, very anciently. Like Shiva is depicted with a drum, the Damaru. And so that's a typical element of shamanism. It is in order to whip yourself up into a frenzy. Um, this uh, shamanism is all very nice, but yoga, which according to Mircea Eliade is an evolute starting from shamanism, uh, is much more refined. And so it doesn't seek visions. No, it seeks, you know, what uh, Swami Agehananda Bharati has called the zero experience, or what is called in the Katha Upanishad, the um, uh, Paramagati, the uh, the highest state, or in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is defined as stilling the motions of the mind. So, which is quite the opposite of, of shamanism, which excites the mind, which seeks colorful, impressive visions. Here you seek silence. So that development that took place in India, that was there in the beginning, in uh, the, the, the related branches of Indo-European, but there it got lost. And so there they were stuck with the image of Wodan as a sort of uh, archetypal shaman, but it never reached the, the level of sophistication that uh, Shiva symbolized. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or remarks Thank or you. objections? 
I think we have time. Uh, we are already above time, but we have time for maybe one question. Okay. Or if anybody has uh, any questions, they can send it to us and we can forward it to Dr. Elst. But maybe one more question if, uh, if anybody has. There is one in the question answer box from Rahul Srivastav, which says, is there any connection between yoga and Shiva? Which I think was answered later in the... Yeah. Ah, well, uh, I, I haven't gone into that simply because I thought that that was understood by everyone, at least in India. So, of course, Shiva is the archetypal yoga, the Adi Yogi. And so that is not some insight that I have come to offer. I thought that that was generally uh, well known. And so in the symbolism, in the iconography of Shiva, you have these different stages of this you know, primitive shamanism. You see, sometimes Shiva is depicted as smoking a chillum, and you still find chillum smoking sadhus in India. So that continuity between the more advanced practices of today's Hinduism with this ancient shamanism that is still there, you know, you have something very similar in Japanese uh, Shintoism or in Chinese Taoism where this pretty universal shamanism has been refined, has been, has evolved to something more subtle, more advanced. Um, but then Shiva also means precisely that more advanced stage. And so there is Shiva is depicted as an ascetic uh, living in a cave in the mountains, uh, not as a, as a wild man, but simply as somebody who isolates himself in order to concentrate on this sadhana. So, uh, so that you don't find in the case of Woden, uh, he is still stuck in that shamanic state, stage. Though the elements in his symbolism are present of the yogic stage, but it has not fully developed, at least not as far as we know, because uh, what we do know is that those, those uh, spiritual leaders of the people in Europe uh, shunned writing. They didn't write their traditions down. And so once Christianity came, these traditions were lost. So we don't know exactly what they stood for. Uh, but at any rate, I think that the primitive element is predominant, like for instance, people brought human sacrifices to the gods, and uh, that was only gradually abolished, like the Romans abolished it in 200 BC thereabouts. And so they, they still knew in themselves that they had just exorcised it from their own culture. And when they encountered it in Gaul or in Germany, they were you know, appalled by the primitiveness, by the barbarity of my ancestors. Um, so you see in India too, that had been known. And in, in the Vedas, the theoretical possibility of human sacrifice is still entertained, is still known, but they didn't do it anymore. They had outgrown it. Um, so that's part of a process of civilization of which uh, more, uh, more direct part, the one that concerned us here, is the evolution from seeking sensation to seeking mental silence. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Prof, uh, for that fascinating talk. And uh, we're very grateful. That was the first guest lecture. We are moving on in the interest of time and uh, mm -hmm. uh, request everyone to send us questions which we can share later with the professor.